from around the globe, it's the Cube, presenting Cube on Cloud, brought to you by SiliconANGLE. Welcome back to the live segment of the Cube on Cloud. I'm Dave Vellante with my co-host John Furrier. John Rose is here. He's the global CTO at Dell Technologies. John, great to see you as always. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Absolutely, good to be here. Hey, so we're going to talk edge. Uh, you know the. The edge, it's, it's estimated it's a multi, multi-trillion dollar opportunity, but it's a highly fragmented, very complex. I mean, it comprises from autonomous vehicles, you know, windmills, even you know, retail stores, outer space. <laughs> and it's, so it brings in a lot of really gnarly technical issues that we want to pick your brain on. But let me start with just what, what to you is edge? How do you think about it? Yeah, yeah, well, I think, I mean, I, I've been saying for a while that edge is the, the when you reconstitute IT back out in the real world, you know, for 10 years, we've been sucking IT out of the real world, taking it out of factories. You know, nobody has an email server under their desk anymore. Uh, and that was because we could put it in data centers and cloud, public clouds. And, you know, that, that, that's that been a, a good journey. And then we realized, wait a minute, all the data actually was being created out in the real world. And a lot of the actions that have to come from that data have to happen in real time in the real world. And so we realized we actually had to, reconstitute an IT capacity out near where the data is created, consumed and, and utilized. And, you know, that turns out to be smart cities, smart factories, you know, uh, yeah, we're dealing with, you know, military apparatus, which are saying, how do you put, you know, edges into war fighting theaters or first responder environments. It's really anywhere that data exists that needs to be processed and understood and acted on that isn't in a data center. And so it's kind of one of these things, defining edge is easier to define what it isn't. It's anywhere that you're going to have IT capacity that isn't aggregated into a public or private cloud data center. And that, so that seems to be the answer. So follow, follow, the, follow the data. And so uh, you've got these, you know, the big issue of course is latency. People saying, well, some applications or some use cases like autonomous vehicles, you have to make the decision locally. Others you can, you can send back and you can model. Is there some kind of magic algorithm that technical people use to figure out you know, what the right yeah. approach is? Yeah, the good news is math still works. And, and <laughs> you know, you know we, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about why you'd build an edge. You know, not all things belong at the edge. Let's just get that out of the way. And so we started to think, well, what does belong at the edge? And it turns out there's four things. Uh, you need, you know, if you, you need real time responsiveness in the full closed loop of processing data, uh, you might want to put it in an edge, but then you have to define real time. And real time varies, you know, real time might be uh, one millisecond, it might be 30 milliseconds, it might be 50 milliseconds. And it turns out that, yeah, if it's 50 milliseconds, you probably can do that in a co-located data center pretty far away from those devices. If it's one millisecond, you better be doing it on the device itself. And so, so the latency around real time processing matters. And, you know, the other reasons, interesting enough to do edge actually don't have to do with real time processing. They have to do with, there's so much data being created at the edge that if you just flow it all the way across the internet, you'll overwhelm the internet. So we have a need to pre-process and post-process data and control the flow across the world. The third one is the ITOT boundary that we all know. That was the IOT thing that we were dealing with for a long time. And the fourth, which is the fascinating one is it's actually a place where you might want to inject your security boundaries because security tends to be a huge problem in connected things because they're kind of dumb and kind of simple and kind of exposed. And if you protect them on the other end of the internet, the surface area you're protecting is enormous. So there's a big shift to basically move security functions to the edge. Which I think Gartner even made up a term for it called SASE. You know, it's a, yeah. a security enabled edge. Uh, but but these are the four big ones. We've, we've actually tested that for probably about a year with customers. And it turns out that, you know, seems to hold. If it's one of those four things, you might want to yeah. think about an edge. If it isn't, it probably doesn't belong yeah. in it. John, I want to get your thoughts on that point. The security thing's huge. We talked about that last time at Dell Tech World when we did an interview with you on theCUBE. But now look at what's happened over the past few months. We've been having a lot of investigative reporting here at Silicon Angle on the notion of misinformation. Not just fake news, everyone talks about that with the election, but misinformation as a vulnerability. Because you have now edge devices that need to be secured, but I can send misinformation to devices. So, you know, fake news could be fake data. Say, hey, Tesla, drive off the road, or, you know, do this, that, and the other thing. So you got to have the vulnerabilities looked at. And it could be everything. Data is one of them. Latency, uh, secure, is there a chip on the device? Could you share your vision on how you see that uh, being handled? Because it's a huge problem. Yeah, this is this is a big deal because you know what you're describing is the fact that if data is everything, the flow of data ultimately turns into the flow of information, the knowledge and wisdom and action. And if you pollute the data, if you can compromise it, the most rudimentary levels by I don't know putting 
you know, add data into a sensor or tricking the sensor, which lots of people can do, or simulating a sensor, uh, you can actually distort things like AI algorithms. You can introduce bias into them. And that's a, that's a real problem. The solution to it isn't making the sensors smarter. There's this weird catch-22 when you sensorize the world. You know, you have a you know finite amount of power and budget, and the making sensors fatter and more complex is actually the wrong direction. So edges have materialized from that security dimension as an interesting augment to those connected things. And so imagine a world where you know, your sensor is creating data, and maybe you have hundreds or thousands of sensors that are flowing into an edge compute layer. And the edge compute layer isn't just aggregating it, it's putting context on it. It's, it's metadata that it's adding to the system saying, hey, that particular stream of telemetry came from this device and I'm watching that device and I can score it and understand whether it's been compromised or whether it's trustworthy or whether it's a risky device. And as that all flows into the metadata world, the, the, the overall understanding of not just the data itself, but where did it come from? Is it likely to be trustworthy? Should you score it higher or lower in your neural net to basically manipulate your algorithm? These kind of things are really sophisticated and powerful tools to protect against this kind of injection of false information at the, at the sensor. But you could never do that at a sensor. You have to do it at a place that has more compute capacity and is more able to kind of enrich the data and enhance it. So that's why we think edges are important in that fourth characteristic of they aren't the security system of the sensor itself, but they're the way to make sure that there's integrity in the sensorized world before it reaches the internet, before it reaches the cloud data centers. So and access to that is metadata well. is access to the metadata is critical and it's gotta be it's gotta be near real time, if not real time, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and you know, the, the important thing is, uh, well, I'll tell you this, you know, if you haven't figured this out by looking at cybersecurity issues, you know, compromising the, the, the authoritative metadata is a really good compromise. If you can get that, you can manipulate things at a scale you've never imagined. Well, in this case, if the metadata is actually authoritatively controlled by the edge node, the edge node is processing, it, is determining whether or not this is trustworthy or not, those edge nodes are not $5 parts, they're servers, they're higher end systems, and you can inject a lot more sophisticated security technology in it. You can have hardware root of trust, you can have you know, more advanced PKI in it, you can have AI engines watching the behavior of it. And you, again, you'd never do that at a sensor, but if you do it at the first step into the overall data pipeline, which is really where the edge is materializing, you can do much more sophisticated things to the data, but you can also protect that thing at a level that you'd never be able to do to protect a smart light bulb or a, a, a thermostat in your house. Yes. So John, give us the playbook on how you see the evolution of the, this market. I'll see these are key foundational things uh, as a distributed network and it's, uh, you know, IOT turns into industrial IOT, vice versa. As, a, as software becomes critical, what is the programming model to build the modern applications? This is something that I know you guys, I talked to Michael Dell about this in theCUBE and everyone in your companies, or, as well as everyone else. It's software defined everything these days, right? So what is the software framework? How do people code on this? What's the application aware viewpoint on this? Yeah, the, the, this is, uh, that's a, that, unfortunately it's a very complex area that's got a lot of dimensions to it. But let, me, let me walk you through a couple of them in, in terms of what is the software framework for, for, for the edge? Well, the first is that we have to separate edge platforms from the actual edge workload. Today, too many of the edge dialogues are this amorphous blob of code running on an appliance, we call that an edge. And the reality is that thing is actually doing two things. It's a platform of compute out in the real world, and it's some kind of extension of the cloud data pipeline or the cloud operating model instantiated as software, probably as containerized code sitting on that edge platform. Our first principle about the software world is we have to separate those two things. You do not build your cloud, your edge platform commingled with the thing that runs on it. That's like you know building your app into the OS. That's just dumb. User space kernel, you keep those two things separate. We have to start to enforce that discipline in the software model at the edge as a first principle. The second is we have to recognize that that edges are, are probably best implemented in ways that don't require a lot of human intervention. Uh, you know, humans are bad when it comes to really complex distributed systems. And so what we're finding is that most of the code being pushed into production benefits from using things like Kubernetes or container orchestration or even functional frameworks like, you know, the serverless FAS type models because those low code architectures generally are interfaced with via APIs through CI CD pipelines without a lot of human touch on it. And it turns out that you know, those actually work reasonably well because the edges, when you look at them in production, 
the code actually doesn't change very often. They kind of do singular things relatively well over a period of time. And if you can make that a fully automated function by basically taking all of the human intervention away from it, and if you can program it through low code interfaces or through automated interfaces, you take a lot of the risk out of the human intervention piece of, of this type of environment. We all know that you know, most of the errors and conditions that break things are not because the technology fails, it because it's because a human being touches it. So in the software paradigm, we're big fans of more modern software paradigms that have a lot less touch from human beings and a lot more automation being applied to the edge. The last thing I'll leave you with though is, we do have a problem with some of the edge software architectures today because what happened early in the IoT world is people invented kind of new edge software platforms. And we were involved in these, you know, uh, EdgeX Foundry, Mobile EdgeX, uh, uh, Crano. And those were very important because they gave you a set of functions and capabilities at the edge that you kind of needed in the early days. Our long-term vision though for edge software is that it really needs to be the same code base that we're using in data centers and public clouds. It needs to be the same cloud stack, the same orchestration level, the same automation level, because what you're really doing at the edge is not something bespoke. You're taking a piece of your data pipeline and you're pushing it to the edge and the other pieces are living in private data centers and public clouds and you'd like them to all operate under the same framework. So we're big believers in like pushing Kubernetes orchestration all the way to the edge, pushing the same FAS layer all the way to the edge and don't create a bespoke world at the edge, make it an extension of the multi-cloud software framework. So Even though the underlying, the underlying hardware might change, the microprocessor or GPU might change, or GPU or whatever it is. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, by, by the way, that, that, that's a really good reason to use these modern frameworks because in the world of heterogeneous <laughs> yeah. compute where it's not always an x86 underneath it, programming down at the OS level in traditional languages has an awful lot of hardware dependencies. We need to separate that because we're going to have a lot of ARM, we're going to have a lot of accelerators, a lot of DPUs, a lot of other stuff out there. And so the software has to be modern and able to support heterogeneous compute, which a lot of these new frameworks do quite well. Well, John, John. thanks thanks so much for, for coming on, really spending some time with us. And uh, you're always a great guest. I really appreciate it. Yeah, great, great to be here. Great stuff. Thanks for having have me. a technical edge ongoing room, Dave. This is going to be a great topic. It's a clubhouse room for us. We'll, we'll do a technical edge session every time. Really valuable. Yeah. Thanks again, you John. More. John Rose. Thank you. Yeah, appreciate Thank you. It. Okay, so now we're gonna we're gonna move to the second part of our uh, of our technical edge discussion. Chris Wolf is here. He leads the advanced architecture group at VMware, and that really means so. Chris is, looks at I think it's three years out is kind of his time horizon. So you know, advanced architecture, and uh, yeah. So uh, really excited to have you here, Chris. Uh, can you hear us okay? Um, uh, sure can. Great awesome. to see right. you. Great to see you again. Great, Great to see to you. See Thanks you. for coming on. Really appreciate awesome. it. Awesome. So we're talking about the edge. We're talking about the things that you see. You know, we, we set it up as a, a multi-trillion dollar opportunity. It's it's defined all over the place. Uh, we, we joke, it could be a windmill. You know, it could be a retail store. It could be something in outer space. It's, 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 it's you know, whatever is defined, a factory, a military installation, et cetera. How, how do you look at the edge and, and, and how do you think about the technical evolution? Yeah, I think it was interesting listening to John and I would say we're very well aligned there. You know, we also would see the edge as really the place where data is created, processed and or consumed. And um, I think what's interesting here is that you have a number of challenges in that edges are different. So like John was talking about Kubernetes and there's, there's multiple different Kubernetes open source projects that are trying to address these different edge use cases, whether it's K3S or KubeEdge or open yurt or super edge. And I mean, the list goes on and on. And the reason that you see this conflict of projects is multiple reasons. You have a platform that's uh, not really designed to uh, support edge computing, which Kubernetes was designed for data center infrastructure uh, first. Uh, and then you have these different environments so where you have some edge sites that have connectivity to the cloud and you have some websites that just simply don't, right? Whether it's an oil rig or a cruise ship, you have all these different use cases. So what we're seeing is, you can't just say this is our edge platform and you know go consume it because it won't work. You actually have to have multiple flavors of your edge platform and decide you know what what you should time first from a market perspective. Mm -hmm. Chris, I'm going to ask you. Great to have you on. We've had many chats on the queue during when we actually would go to events and be on the ground. But really appreciate you coming into our first days. virtual <laughs> editorial event. We'll be to do more of these. This is our software we'd be putting to work to do 
kind of a clubhouse model where we get these talks going and make them really valuable. Um, but this one's important because one of the things that's come up all day, and we kind of introduced it early and come back every time is the standardization openness of how open source is going to extend out this, this uh, interoperability kind of vibe. And then the second theme is, and we were kind of talking about the OSI stack, you can throw back the old days. Uh, I'm talking about Kubernetes as a nice layer. But then also, what is going to be the programming model for modern applications? Okay, with the edge being obviously a key part of it. What's your take on, on that vision? Because that's a complex area, certainly a lot, of, a lot of software to be written, still to come, some software that needs to be written today as well. So what's your view on how do you program for the edge? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, John. And I would say with COVID, we have seen some examples of organizations that have been successful when they had already built an edge uh, for the expectation of change. So when you have a truly software defined edge, you can make some of these rapid pivots quite quickly. You know, an example was Vanderbilt University had to put a thousand hospital beds in a parking garage and they needed dynamic network and security to be able to accommodate that. You know, we had a, a lab testing company that had to roll out 400 testing sites in a matter of weeks. So when you can start to have first and foremost, think about the edge as being our edge agility as being defined as, you know, what is the speed of software? How quickly can I push updates? How quickly can I uh, transform my application posture or my security posture uh, in lieu of these uh, types of events is, is super important. Now, if, then if we walk that back, you know, to your point on open source, you know, we see open source is really, uh, you know, the key enabler for driving edge innovation and driving an ISV ecosystem around that edge innovation. You know, we mentioned Kubernetes, but there's other really important projects that we're already seeing strong traction in the edge. You know, a, a project such as EdgeX Foundry is seeing significant growth in China. Uh, and that is the, the, at its core, EdgeX Foundry was about giving you a pass for some of your IoT apps and services. Another one that's quite interesting is the open source FATE project in the Linux Foundation. And uh, FATE is really addressing ML at the edge through a federated ML model, which we think is the going to be the long-term dominant model for uh, localized uh, machine learning training as we continue to see massive scale out to these edge sites. Right, so I wonder if you could, you could pick up on that. I mean, th in, in, in thinking about AI inferencing at the edge, um, how do you see that, that evolving? Uh, maybe, you know, what's, maybe you could, we could double click on the architecture that you guys see uh, uh, progressing. Yeah, yeah, right now we're doing some really good work, uh, as I mentioned, with the FATE project. Uh, we're one of the key contributors to the project today. Uh, we, we see that you need to expand the breadth of contributors uh, to uh, these types of projects for starters. Uh, some of these, uh, what we've seen is sometimes the early momentum starts in China because there is a lot of uh, innovation associated with the edge there. And now it starts to be pulled uh, a, a bit further west. So I, when you look at federated learning, we do believe that the emergence of 5G uh, is not, doesn't really help you to centralize data. It really creates a more opportunity to create, put more data in more places. So that's, you know, that's the first challenge that you have. But then when you look at federated learning in general, I'd say there's two challenges that we still have to overcome. Organizations that have very sophisticated data science practices are really well versed here. And I'd say they're at the forefront of some of these innovations, but that's 1% of enterprises today. We have to start looking at about solutions for the 99% of enterprises. And I'd say even VMware partners such as Microsoft and Azure Cognitive Services, as an example, they've been addressing ML for the 99%. I'd say that's a, that's a positive development. When you look in the open source community, it's one thing to build a platform, right? Look, we love to talk about platforms, that's the easy part, but it's the apps that run on that platform and the services that run on that platform that drive adoption. So the work that we're incubating in the VMware CTO office is not just about building platforms, but it's about building the applications that are needed by say that 99% of enterprises to drive that adoption. So if you if, if you carry that through, that, that I, I infer from that, Chris, that the developers are ultimately going to kind of win the edge or define the edge. Um, do you, how do you see that um, from their perspective? Yeah, I think it's uh, way I like to look at this. I like to call it pragmatic DevOps, where the winning formula is actually giving the developer the core services that they need using the native tools and the native APIs that they prefer. And that is predominantly open source with some cloud services as they start to come to the edge as well. But then beyond that, 
there's no reason that IT operations can't have the tools that they prefer to use as well. So we see this coming together of two worlds where IT operations has to think even far differently about edge computing where it's not enough to assume that IT has full control of all of these different devices and sensors and things that exist at the edge. It doesn't happen. Oftentimes it's the lines of business that are directly uh, deploying these types of infrastructure solutions or application services is a better phrase and uh, connecting them to the networks at the edge. So what does this mean? From an IT operations perspective, we need to have dynamic discovery capabilities and more policy and automation that can allow the developers to have the velocity they want, but still have that consistency of security, agility, networking, and all of the other hard stuff that somebody has to solve. And you can't have the best of both worlds here. So if Amazon turned the data center into an API, and then the, the, the traditional you know, vendors sort of caught up or catching up and, and kind of doing the same on-prem. Is, is the edge uh, one big API? Is it coming from the cloud? Is it coming from the, the on-prem world? How, how do you see that evolving? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I think that's the, that's the question. And, and I think race is on. <laughs> yeah, but it doesn't, it doesn't have to be uh, exclusive in one way or another. The VMware perspective is that, you know, we can have a, a consistent platform for open source, a consistent platform for cloud services. And I think the key here is this, you know, if you look at the partnerships we've been driving, you know, we've onboarded Amazon RDS onto our platform. We announced a tech preview of Azure Arc SQL database as a service on our platform as well in addition to everything we're doing with open source. So the way that we're looking at this is you don't want to make a bet on an edge appliance with one cloud provider, because what happens if you have a business partner that says, I, I'm aligned to Google or I'm aligned to AWS or I want to use this open source. Our philosophy is to virtualize the edge so that software can dictate, you know, uh, organization's velocity at the end of the day. Yeah, so Chris, you come on, you were you were an analyst at Gartner, you know us, everything's a zero sum game, <laughs> but it's but but life is not like that, right? I mean, and there's so much of an incremental opportunity, especially at the edge. I mean, the, the numbers are are mind boggling when, when you look at it. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. And I and I think you're seeing a maturity in the vendor landscape too, where we know we can't solve all the problems ourselves, and nobody can. So we have to partner and we have to, to your earlier point on APIs we have to build external interfaces into our platforms to make it very easy for customers to have choice around ISV vendors, partners, and so on. So Chris, I got to ask you, since you run the advanced technology group in charge of what's going on there, will there be a, um, a shift in focus on more chips at the edge with Pat Gelsinger going over to Intel? Um, <laughs> good to Look see for, Pat uh, go no, back to the, great, the mother ship, so to speak. Um, and all, all kidding aside, but you know, Pat's leaving, um, big news around VMware. I saw some of your tweets that you, you, you laid out there, which is a nice tribute to Pat, but that's going to be cool. Pat's going to be at Intel, maybe some more, more advanced stuff there. Yeah, I think for, well, Pat's staying on the VMware board. And to me, it's, it's really, think about it. I mean, Pat was part of the team that brought us the x86, right? And to come back to Intel as the CEO, it's really the perfect bookend to his career. So. We're really sad to see him go. Can't blame him. Of course, it's it's a it's a nice chapter for Pat. So totally understand that. And we prior to Pat going to Intel, we announced major partnerships with NVIDIA uh, last year. Uh, where we've been doing a lot of work with ARM. So to us, again, we see all of this as opportunity. And a lot of the advanced development projects we're running right now in the CTO office is about expanding that uh, that ecosystem in terms of how vendors can participate whether you're running an application on ARM, whether it's running on x86 or whatever it's running on what comes next, including a variety of hardware accelerators. So wanna, is, is, it really, that. is that really irrelevant to you? I mean, you heard John Rose talk about that because it's all you know, containerized. Is it, is it is a technology, is it truly irrelevant what you know, processor is underneath and what underlying hardware architecture is there or? No, is that a it's not, uh, yeah. you know, and it's funny, right? Because we always want to say these things like, well, it's just a commodity, but it, it's not, you, you would then be asking the hardware vendors to, to pack up their balls and go home because there's just nothing, nothing left to do. And we're seeing actually quite the opposite uh, where there's this emergence and variety of so many hardware accelerators. So even from an innovation perspective for us, we're looking at ways to increase the velocity by which organizations can take advantage of these different specialized hardware components, because that's, that's going to continue to be a race 
But the real key is to make it seamless that an application can take advantage of these benefits without having to go out and buy all of this different hardware on a per application basis. But but if you do make bets, you can optimize for that architecture, true or not? And I mean, our estimate is that the, you know, the number of wafers coming out of ARM-based you know, platforms is, 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 is 10X x86. And so it appears that, you know, from a cost standpoint, that's, that's got some real hard decisions to make, or maybe, maybe they're easy decisions, I don't know. But so you have to make bets, do you not as a technologist and try to optimize for one of those architectures, even though you have to hedge those bets? Yeah, we do. It, it really boils down to use cases and seeing, mm -hmm. you know, what do you need for a particular use case? Like, you know, you mentioned ARM, you know, there's a lot of ARM out at the edge and on smaller form factor devices, not so much in the traditional enterprise data center today. So our bets and a lot of the focus there has been on those types of devices. Yep. And again, it's it's really the, it's about timing, right? The customer demand versus when we need to make a particular move from an innovation perspective. Right. It's my final question for you as we wrap up our day here with Great Cube on Cloud Day. What is the most important stories in, in the cloud tech world, edge and or cloud that you think people should be paying attention to that will matter most to them over the next few years? Wow, that's a huge question. How much time do we have? Not, not enough. Okay. Is Two minutes. Yeah. Is, is, it, is it architectural things they got to focus on? I mean, just a lot of people are looking at this COVID thing. I got to come out with a growth strategy. Obviously it's some clear, obvious things to see cloud native. Yeah, you know, yeah. Let, let, me, let me break it down this way. I think the most important thing that people have to focus on is deciding how do they, when they build their architectures, what is the reliance on cloud services? native cloud services, so for more proprietary services versus open source technologies uh, such as Kubernetes and the ISV ecosystem around Kubernetes. You know, one is an investment in flexibility and control, uh, lots of management and uh, for your intellectual property, right? Where maybe I'm building this application in the cloud today, but tomorrow I have to run it out to, at the edge or I do an acquisition that I just wasn't expecting, or I just simply don't know. Sure, we, we, we sure hope that COVID doesn't come around again or something like it right, as we get past this and navigate this today, but architecting for the expectation of change is really important and having flexibility around your intellectual property, including flexibility to be able to deploy and run on different clouds, especially as you build up your different partnerships. That's really key. So building a discipline to say, you know what, this is database as a service. It's never going to define who I am as a business. It's something I have to do as an IT organization. I'm consuming that from the cloud this part of the application stack that defines who I am as a business, my app dev team is building this with Kubernetes and I'm going to maintain you know, more flexibility around that intellectual property. The strategic discipline to operate this way among many of our enterprise customers just hasn't gotten there yet, but I think that's going to be a key inflection point as we start to see you know, these hybrid architectures continue to mature. Hey, Chris, great stuff, man. Really appreciate you coming on, on the Cube and participating in the Cube on Cloud. Thank you for your perspectives. Great. David, thank you very much. Always a pleasure. All right, great All right. to see you. And thank you everybody for, for watching. This ends the Cube on Cloud, Dave Vellante and John Furrier. All these uh, sessions are going to be available on demand. All the write-ups will hit siliconangle.com. So check that out. We'll have links to this site up there. Really appreciate you, know, you attending our, our, our first virtual editorial event. Again, this is Dave Vellante for John Ferrier and the entire CUBE and CUBE on Cloud team, CUBE 365. Thanks for watching.